Praise God for what He has done. It is good to be together this morning, and we are so glad that you are with us today. We're continuing, as we have been for such a long time, through the Gospel of John. And for five weeks, Jesus has been celebrating the Passover dinner with His disciples. That has been quite the dinner. And Jesus has been throwing out these theological hand grenades that are just exploding left and right. And if you think about the theological content that we have taken in over the last five weeks, you can imagine what it was like for his disciples to be hit by one theological bomb after another, all in the course of one night. And it's not stopping yet. Because Jesus has so much more that he is instructing them on. You know, last week we saw Jesus talking about the relationship between love and obedience. And he said things to them like, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. We we, we can get that. We can see the connection between obedience and love. In fact, we're going to hear more about that today. But then he throws out this theological hand grenade. He says, my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home in him. The God of the universe is going to come and he's going to reside in them. And then he says, I will send my spirit and he will guide you. And if you're here for the first time today and you haven't heard this language before, if that just sounds like the craziest thing you've ever heard, it did to them too. And if you've been in the church for a while and you've gotten kind of used to this language and it doesn't sound that crazy, then we need to recapture a sense of how amazing how miraculous it is that the God of the universe is going to make his home inside of us, that he is living within us, and that his spirit is guiding us. Now, Jesus understands how hard that is to grapple with. And so in the passage we read today, he's going to take another example to help them process what that means and what that looks like. But there's there's a verse that we read, a tiny little verse right at the end of chapter 14. And Jesus says, come now, let us leave. And so scholars are a little bit divided on how to take that because at at the end of chapter 14, he says, come, let us leave. And then at the beginning of chapter 18, it says that when he had finished praying, Jesus with his disciples left and crossed the Kidron Valley, and they went over to the other side where there's an olive grove, and that's where we see his arrest take place. So at the end of 14, he says, let us leave, and at the beginning of 18, it says that they left. And so there's two different ways of interpreting this. The first way of interpreting it is that Jesus says, let's go, but then they get back into conversation, and it takes quite a while for them to actually leave. So at the beginning of chapter 18 is them actually leaving the upper room. And you can understand what that looks like, because I'm sure you've been at somebody's house, and you say, oh, it's getting late. It's time to get going. And maybe you even stand up and start heading towards the door, but then you get back into conversation, and it's another 10 minutes, another 20 minutes, another half hour before you actually get going. So that might be what's happening here. They might still be in the upper room waiting to get going. But I think more commentators take this to mean that they did get up and leave. They begin their journey across the Kidron Valley, and they come across an all, or sorry, they come across the vineyard. And it's walking through this vineyard, seeing these vines, that Jesus picks up this conversation of the vine and the branches. And so if that's the case, then at the beginning of chapter 18, when it says they got up and left, it means they got up and they left the vineyard to continue on where they had been headed. And now we can't confirm it one way or the other, but I have to admit, that seems like a pretty Jesus-y thing to do, doesn't it? (laughs) He has a theological point that he wants to emphasize, and so he capitalizes on the imagery that that they're experiencing, what they see, and he says, you know what? This imagery can help you understand what I've been talking about. 
So I think it would be reasonable as we, pick, as we read chapter 15 to picture them walking through a vineyard. And Jesus looking at the vine and explaining how this vine illustrates their connection to God. And even if that isn't the case, even if they are still in the upper room, at the very least, that is the imagery that Jesus is drawing to mind. So you can go ahead and have that image in your mind as we read chapter 15. Before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise God for what you have done, for the accomplished, completed work of Jesus Christ, and for the promise that you reside in us. And so today, as we read your word and understand what that means and what that looks like, we pray that your spirit would move within us and that you'd say to us what we need to hear from you, that you would comfort and challenge and convict and change us and make us into the people you have created us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go at the beginning of chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear, bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be complete in you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this: love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not cho choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. All right, so let's begin with the first two words. I am. This is the seventh and final I am statement that Jesus made throughout the book of John. Throughout the book of John, we've seen Jesus reveal himself bit by bit in a way that his disciples' understanding of who he is has been growing and growing and growing. And each time he says I am, whatever follows that is another revelation about what Jesus means, who Jesus is, what Jesus is doing. And so these I am statements are like a review and summary of the book of John to this point. He said, I am the bread of life. In John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He said, I am the light of the world. In John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. He said, I am the door to salvation. In John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He says, I am the good shepherd. In John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
in John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. Who who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. In John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No, No one comes to the Father except through me. And now finally, Jesus says, I am the true vine. And what he's saying isn't just a metaphor. He's not just saying, I'm like a vine. He is unraveling for us, unpacking another tremendous theological truth. He says, I am the true vine. So when he says, I am the true vine, he's comparing himself to something else. And his disciples heard this loud and clear. They knew exactly what Jesus meant when he said to them that I am the true vine. Because they had the scriptures. And they knew the scriptures. And they knew that time and time and time again throughout the Old Testament, Israel is called the vine. And God is called the gardener that takes care of the vine. We read, for example, in Psalm 80, it says, You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. You took, it took root and filled the land. Well, it's God's preparing a place for Israel in the land. The, the Jewish community understood this symbolism. They embraced this symbolism, and they used this symbolism. They identified with this symbolism. They had it on the front of the temple. Josephus describes the front of the temple in Jesus' day. He said, over the doors of the temple was spread out a golden vine with its branches hanging down from a great height, the largeness and fine workmanship of which was a surprising sight to the spectators to see what vast materials there were and with what great workmanship it was done. So the door of the temple was a grapevine. And then they used it on their coins, like the one on the screen. This is called the Bar Kokhba coin. It's from the time of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, just shortly after the time of Jesus. But this is not a Roman coin. This is a coin that is minted by the Jewish community for use within the Jewish community. And on one side of it is the grapevine, and on the other side is the cluster of grapes. Because it was their own imagery. It's like the the bald eagle on our coins, when you see the symbol of a bald eagle, you know what it represents. It represents the United States of America. And so when they saw the symbol of the grapevine, they knew he's talking about Israel. And so he says to them, I am the true vine. But there's another aspect of that imagery that they may not have embraced. Because at least 10 times in the, in the Old Testament, Israel is called a vine. And almost every time, God is using that imagery to tell them that they're not bearing fruit the way that God intended them to. So we see in Isaiah 5, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones. He planted it with the choicest of vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Hosea says that Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars, and his land prospered as he adorned his sacred stones. Their heart is deceitful, and now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones. And finally, in Jeremiah, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine. So this symbolism is not only referring to Israel as the vine, but it's saying they haven't produced fruit the way that God intended. But then, still in this Old Testament imagery, something really remarkable happens. Because later in Psalm 80, we already read the beginning, but later in Psalm 80, it says, return to us, God Almighty, look down from heaven and see, watch over this vine. The root 
your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. So now the vine is called the sun. It says, your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire, at your rebuke your people perish. Let your hand rest upon the man at your right hand, the one who is seated at the right hand of God, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. There's already a promise of the true vine that is going to allow the people of God to bear fruit. And that is what Jesus is claiming. He is claiming to be the fulfillment of everything that Israel was intended to be. He says, what the vine did not produce, I will produce. What it did not fulfill, I will fulfill. And in me, the people of God get to be what they were always intended to be. That's so important for us to keep in mind that the promises are fulfilled in Jesus. If you've been to our Sunday night prayer gatherings, you know that we've been praying for the conflict going on in Israel. We want to continue that prayer. And as we do, we need to remember where the promise of peace is found. It's found in Jesus. Because in Ephesians, Paul says that he himself is our peace. And Jesus said, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, but I will give you my peace. And so this morning, I want to lead us in another prayer. But I want to pray for the peace of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? God, this morning, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all of the areas surrounding it, for the men and women and children that are being caught up in war, who have been attacked or killed or displaced. It's a physical war, but it's also a spiritual war. So we pray for a ceasefire, for an end to hostility, for that earthly peace that is the absence of conflict. But we pray so much more that you would bring to them your peace, the peace that only is to be found in Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. We ask that you would make yourself known, that your kingdom would spread upon the earth. God, we pray for the faithful community of believers those who are in Christ, Lord, would they shine like a city on a hill, like a lamp in the darkness. And for those who do not know you, that they would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, who is the only way to the Father and the only source of lasting peace. We pray this in the name of the only God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. We are halfway through verse 1. Because after saying that he is the true vine, Jesus says that my father is the gardener. And that's also not a new image because in the passages that we read from the Old Testament, we already saw that God was the gardener of the vine. So Jesus is carrying that on and saying that my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So as I was reading this passage and contemplating it this week, I was sitting in our backyard. And five years ago, we planted grapes in our backyard. And so I've been slowly learning. I just took that picture yesterday. I've been slowly learning the process of what it looks like to cultivate grapes and the way that they need to be pruned. Before I talk about grapes, can I just uh, hash out a beef with Washington State? Right? (laughs) You all mutilate your trees. Every place I go, I, go th- I drive through these communities, and every tree is hacked to pieces. The branches are cut off down to a stump. And yeah, they grow back, but it's this tiny little mutilated tree. I come from North Dakota, and we don't do that to our trees. <laughs> we let our trees grow, and so in our neighborhoods, in the mature, developed neighborhoods, you have the street lined with these 50-foot-tall trees that form an arch over the road, and it is beautiful. And I love to go down those streets under the shade of the trees because I hate the heat of the sun. But it's beautiful. And our trees in our neighborhood are starting to get some size. And they're starting to grow. And I'm just so afraid that the HOA is going to come by someday and start hacking those trees to pieces. The trees weren't meant to be hacked to pieces. But you know what? Grapevines are. (laughs) 
I'm serious. Grapevines need that to thrive. They need to be pruned significantly because a single grapevine, a single offshoot, can grow 15 feet in a season. That means they're growing about a foot a week. And so you think that looks wild. I already pruned that this spring. That's just growth from a couple weeks of growing, right? If you don't prune them, they grow everywhere. But they spend all of their energy growing in every direction, and they've got nothing left to produce fruit. So if you let the vines grow everywhere, nothing grows on the vines. And so the first thing we learn is that if we are going to bear fruit, we need to be pruned by God. There are things in our lives that need to be cut out. God's got to come by with these giant clippers and start cutting off limbs, which doesn't sound very good, but it produces health. You know, sometimes it's sin, repeated, reoccurring sin in our life that needs to be cut out. And I see this more in our cherry trees than I do in our grapevines, because in the cherry trees, you'll get a disease that'll start at the end of a branch. And you know it because the leaves start to fall off and the branch turns black. And you can watch that disease start to spread down the branch towards the trunk. And if you let it grow, it'll go into the trunk and into the rest of the branches and your tree's dead. But if you cut off that branch below where the disease is, it stops the disease. And so last fall, I could see that happening on several branches. I clipped them, and this spring, the whole tree is healthy. So sometimes there is sin that is in our lives that is growing, and God has to cut it out before it takes over our entire lives. But sometimes it's not even an issue of sin. Sometimes it's just distractions. We're just going in every direction without, without any purpose, and God needs to prune us so that instead of going everywhere and not producing any fruit, that we can have purpose and direction and that we can be productive, right? And so the first thing that I've learned from the grapevine is that God needs to be pruning us. The second thing that I've learned as I've experienced that pruning process is that once you snip a grapevine, you see water, the sap, flowing out of it. And the sap of a grapevine isn't like the sap of a tree that's thick and sticky. The sap of a grapevine is like water and it just flows. And so if you prune, if you cut all those vines, you cut maybe 40 vines, and then you go under there, it feels like it's raining on you because of the quantity of sap that is flowing out of those vines. And it gives us insight to what's going on inside of those vines all along because it's only the trunk, it's only the stem that is drawing nutrients from the ground and it has to pass that on into the branches, otherwise they die. And you have this constant flowing of life-giving sap from the stem out into the branches. And that is what Jesus is for us. When we are attached to him, we have a constant stream of life flowing from him into us. And so as we understand this image of the grapevine, those are the two things that we want to take away. That we are all connected to Jesus. And we have that spiritual life flowing from him into us. And then we have God, the gardener, on the outside who is coming along cutting off sin, cutting off distraction, pruning us so that we can have purpose and direction and be productive. Do you get that picture? Yep. All right, we're in verse 2. <laughs> From here, Jesus says, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what God the Father is doing. Now, here's what you need to do. You need to remain in me. Now, for us, that word remain sounds passive, but that's not a passive command. It's very active. And to illustrate this, I brought in a rock, right? Great illustration. Now, if I say to this rock, stay, well, the rock doesn't need to do anything to stay because there's no force acting upon it. And the law of inertia says that an object at rest will remain at rest unless it's acted upon by an outside force. And right now, there aren't any forces acting upon this rock except for gravity, which is holding it to the table. So I don't need to tell the rock to stay. There's no forces acting upon it. It's not going anywhere. My dog, Lyric, is a different story. <laughs> and I wish I would have brought a picture of her to put up on the screen today. 
because there's a few commands that she knows really well, and one of them is wait. And we practice this command. I'll fill her, when I'm filling her uh, food bowl, I'll have her sit and wait as I'm filling. And then when I'm done filling, I'll pause for a minute as she's sitting and waiting. And she's looking at me. She's waiting for me to say, okay, so that she can go eat her food. But as she's waiting, I'm watching her, and you can see the battle that's going on inside of her because her instinct is saying, get that food, <laughs> right? She has a force that's acting upon her, but she's been told to wait. Another command that she knows is leave it. And we use that command when she wants to go after something that we don't want her to go after. So last week, Mandy and I were walking with her through our neighborhood, and a rabbit ran across the path and into a neighbor's yard, and she wanted to go chase it. That's her instinct, and you could see that right away. And I said, leave it. She looked at the rabbit. She looked at me. <laughs> and you could see that battle going on inside of her, because she had the, that force, her instincts telling her, go after that rabbit. But she had her master telling her to leave it. She looked back at the rabbit and looked back at me. I said, good girl. And we started walking, right? And so we can see, even in the illustration of a dog, that the command to remain is not a passive command because there are forces that are acting upon us, causing us not to remain in God's will. After telling us to remain... Jesus tells us that no branch can bear fruit in itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in the vine. It says, if a man remains in me and I remain in him, he will bear fruit, but apart from me, you will do nothing. We like to talk about the promises of God. You know, I will never leave you or forsake you. But we don't talk about the promises of God that are phrased in the negative. But here's a promise of God. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You're here this morning and you've been just struggling with something. There's an area of your life that you just don't have any victory. The promise of Jesus is that you're not going to have victory. You're not going to have success if you're trying to do it on your own. If you're trying to bring your own determination, your own knowledge. He says you're going to fail. But then he says, if you remain, then you'll bear fruit, right? So if that's you this morning, and you've been struggling, why can't I have success? You need to ask yourself, are you remaining? Are you doing the work that it takes to remain in Jesus Christ so that he can produce that fruit in you? And then he goes on to, to say something that I think provokes a question in us. He says, if anyone does not remain in me, it's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire. And the question that people always ask when they read that is, does that mean that we can lose our salvation? Well, I'm not going to answer that. Because I think even asking that question is taking us a little bit off track. And here's what I mean. Parents, you know that there's been a time when you've asked your child to do something, and they say, what if I don't? Right? And maybe they say it uh, sassy or defiantly, or maybe they're just asking. They just want to know, hey, what happens if I don't do this? My mom wants me to do this, but what happens if I don't do this? Because they're weighing their options, right? And sometimes we come to God, and he gives us a command, and we say, okay, I hear that, Jesus, but you know, what if I don't? Do I still get to go to heaven? Because if I still get to go to heaven, then maybe this whole remaining thing isn't really that important. And so instead of asking, what if I don't, we need to ask, how do I do it? How do I remain? So how do we remain in Jesus Christ? Well, I think there's three things. The first thing we need to do if we want to remain in Jesus Christ is we need to be in his word. You know, Psalm 1 is painting the picture of a man who is delighting in the law of the Lord. The law is their word for the scripture. So he's delighting in the word of God. And, he said he's, and it says he's like a, a tree planted beside streams of water. And what? It yields its fruit in season. And whatever he does prospers. So by remaining in the word of God, he yields fruit. The second thing we need to do is that we need to be in prayer. We need to be in constant communication with God. 
You know, if you've ever had uh, maybe a college classmate or a former coworker, and you've gone different directions, and you've said, hey, let's keep in touch. Well, what does that really mean? It means that once a year, Facebook will remind you that it's their birthday, and you can tell them happy birthday. But you aren't really remaining in, in fellowship with them. And I think there's a lot of times that that's what we say to God. We say, hey, God, let's keep in touch. Thanks for that salvation. See you next Sunday. I'll let you know if I need anything. But to remain in him means to remain in constant communication through prayer. We need to be in the word and we need to be in prayer. But the third thing, and this is the one that gets overlooked the most, we need to be in community. Because without that, sometimes those first two just don't do it. And if you've ever, heard, if you've ever had a problem, you've had a Christian say to you, read your Bible more and pray more and everything will be fine, you know, that that doesn't always do it. Now, those things are non-negotiable. They're essential. They're foundational. you got to do that. But sometimes you need more than that. Because sometimes the way that God answers that prayer, sometimes the way that God brings that deliverance is through the people around you in community. So if you're not in community, if you're not with people, you're not giving God the opportunity to work through people in your life. You're not giving God the opportunity to work through you in their lives. It's like if there was a grapevine that had a, a stump and just one branch sticking off the side, and that's you. Does that look like a healthy grape? Grapevine? No. And some people might say, well, does that mean if it was just me stranded on a desert island and it was just me and my Bible, does that mean I couldn't be saved? Of course not. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about living the fullness of the life that God has in store for you. And if you're on that desert island with just you and your Bible, one of the first things you would be wanting is someone to be with you. <laughs> You'd be feeling alone because God designed us for community. And so if you are struggling, yes, you need to be in the Word. Ask yourself, am I doing that? Yes, you need to be in prayer. Am I doing that? But you need to be in community. You need to be walking with people who are struggling with the same thing. Because I'm going to tell you, I've been here for 17 years. I can tell you with full confidence, whatever you're struggling with this morning, there's somebody else who's struggling with that same thing. And there's somebody in this room who has struggled with it, and they have been delivered by God, and they can walk you through what that takes. So it might mean something like marriage counseling. It might mean something like addiction counseling. It might mean financial counseling. All of those are just words for finding somebody who has been through what you're going through and can walk through it with you. That's what it means to be in community. And so for us to do the active, hard work of remaining, it means we need to be in the Word, in prayer, and we need to be in community. And so if you're here and maybe you've just come or you've been here for a few weeks, but you like to slip in and you like to slip out, first of all, let me say, I'm so glad you're here. This is where you need to be. But the second thing I'll say is that slipping in and slipping out is not being part of community because you're not putting yourself in a position to build the relationships that God uses to change your life. So that's what it means to remain, and he says, if you remain, you will bear fruit. I'm going to go quickly now, but what does that fruit look like? Well, just like we saw Jesus working in us through that sap, and we saw God working outside of us, pruning us, I think that the fruit is both internal and external. And the internal fruit that God bears in us as we remain in him is the fruit of the Spirit. God says the fruit that the Holy Spirit is going to produce inside of you is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Man, that's what I want my life to be like. And when I look at my life, I say, okay, man, I'm hurting for patience. Oh, I'm hurting for kindness. Oh, I'm struggling with self-control. And to remain in God, be searching his word, be praying, be reaching out to the community, say, guys, help me with this. Help me to grow in my patience. Because the first type of fruit that he produces us in us is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? The first two things on the list, love and joy, are the next two things that Jesus talks about. In verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. 
If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed the Father's commands and remain in his love. Is that making God's love conditional? If you obey God, then he'll love you. Of course not. As while we were yet sinners that Jesus died for us, and he goes on to say the greater love has... The greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. God has already demonstrated his love for us in the most extreme way through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sin. But that doesn't mean we experience that love. So we we receive the love of God, we respond in obedience, and as we respond in obedience, we experience more of God's love. And as we experience more of God's love, we respond in obedience. And as we respond in obedience, we experience more of God's love. And it's this circle that builds and grows and grows and grows. And we experience more and more of the love of God in our lives. And after love, he goes on to talk about joy. He said, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. We need to hear that because we attach such negative connotations to a word like obedience. You hear obedience and you're like, oh, That doesn't sound very good. That sounds boring. That sounds like drudging along. Oh. But no, Jesus said that this is the path to real joy, to true joy, to the joy of the Lord. And that it's not just a little bit of that joy, but that that joy will be made complete in you. So he talks about the first two fruits of the Spirit, love and joy. And I think if Jesus wanted to turn this five-chapter conversation into a ten-chapter conversation, he could have gone on to talk about peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. But he stops at joy. So the internal fruit that God is bearing in us is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then there's the external fruit that God bears in us. We're going to skip to verse 16, where he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Stop there for a minute. If you're here and you're feeling unvalued, unappreciated, unloved, just hear this, that Jesus has chosen you. And not only has he chosen you, but he has appointed you to go and bear fruit, and fruit that will last God like has said there's only two things in his creation that last forever, the word of God and the souls of men and women. And so the fruit that will last is the opportunities that we have to make an impact in the lives of the people around us. He says, if you remain in me, you're going to bear that kind of fruit. You're going to be finding ways to have that impact on the lives of people around you. If you say, I, I, I don't know where that is. I don't know what to do. I don't, f- I don't feel God doing that in me. Well, then maybe you're not remaining. Because if you go back to remaining in God's word, remaining in him through prayer, remaining in the community, he's going to be developing in you a desire to be touching the lives of the people around you. And he's going to be putting in front of you ways to do that. You're going to see children running down the hall, and you're going to hear Mindy standing up here saying, we need people to pour into the lives of these kids. And you say, yes, that's what God's been calling me to do. You're going to be see, seeing new faces coming in the door, people who need the community that you're a part of. And you, say, and you hear Jeff and Christy talk about the First Impressions team that is trying to welcome those people and bring them into community. And you say, yes, that's what God is calling me to do. You're going to hear Dan and Mary talking about the, the veterans' home and saying, hey, come with us and let's pro- provide meals for these people who are alone. And you're going to say, yes, that's what God's calling me to do. God's going to produce fruit in you and through you that will last. That's why he ends with this statement. He said, I don't know how many times he said this, probably 10 times by now, this is my command, that you love one another, that the love of God is operating in us, that we love and receive the love of God to and from one another. So where have we been? We've seen this image of the vine with the life-giving sap flowing through Jesus into us, bringing us life. And God the Father pruning us, giving us direction and purpose. We've seen Jesus telling us to do the work, to do the work of remaining in him by being in his word, by communing with him in prayer, and by being a part of his community. We've seen the inward fruit that God does through that, the fruit of the Spirit, and the external fruit of lives around us that we have the opportunity to touch.
Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you that you have made your home in us and that we have the opportunity to remain in you. But as you make that a command, I pray that you would help us to respond to that command by doing the work of remaining in your word, of fellowshipping with you in prayer, and by connecting with your community. And I pray that we would experience the fruit of that in our lives, that we'd experience love and joy and peace in everything we do. And you'd be helping us to make that lasting impact on the lives of the people around us. We thank you for the way you work in the community, and we look forward to seeing what you have yet to do among us. In Jesus' name, amen.